All right. Hello, 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 everyone. We are so excited to have you here tonight for a special town hall and live stream. Um, we're going to give it just a second for everybody to get in here. Um, so as you're coming in, please say hello. Let us know where you're from. Um, and I would love to hear if there's something that made you smile or laugh this week, regardless of if it was a great week or a not so great week. Is there something that made you smile or laugh this week? Um, and you can feel free to put that in, in the chat. Um, and while y'all are doing that, we um, we can actually share here, um, Ruth or Lauren, I don't know, is there anything that made you smile or laugh this week? Um, yeah, I can share one thing. Um, I actually saw this adorable viral video of a Brussels Griffon barking. And I own a Brussels Griffon and I've always thought mine sounded like a chicken when it barks. And in this video, I swear to gosh, the Brussels sounds just like a chicken when it's barking. It's the funniest video. And I've like watched it on loop so many times. So yeah. I love that. That's awesome, Lauren. Great. That was great. Well, I would say one thing that made me smile this week is I took uh, my dog for a walk in our woods nearby and we have a wildlife in there and two deer came out to greet us as we were walking by. Wow. I love that. I love that. That's awesome. Um, oh, I see we have a couple of folks. Oh, Valerie says grandchildren, one of our awesome lead advocates, Valerie. Um, I know your grandkiddos are super, super important to you. I was going to fit in with the with the kids piece as well. Um, I, it's actually, you know, I asked the question, but it's hard for me to pick. My students made me smile and laugh a lot this weekend, both with this week, um, with things that they were supposed to be doing in class and sometimes things they weren't supposed to be doing in class, but lots of lots of smiling and, and laughing. Um, in light of our theme tonight. Um, well, um, continue as folks come in to say hi, to let us know where you're from. I see that we have someone from Austin, Texas. Um, and we're gonna go ahead and jump into our housekeeping so we can get started, but I'm glad to have you. Oh, and I see Alexandra, one of our advocates just popped on. Alexandra, it's great to see you. Um, so just a quick note before we get started, this live stream is intended to serve as educational content and is not intended to replace therapy. For treatment related questions, please be sure to work with your local provider or contact the local clinician. The International OCD Foundation is, is not a crisis hotline and should be not be used if you're in distress or feel unsafe. If you're in a crisis or if you're ever feeling suicidal or unsafe, please go to your local emergency room, call 911, or call the Suicide Prevention Hotline at 800-273-8255. It's also really important to note that we want to create as safe a space as possible, and we want everyone to be kind and respect all of those who are on our stream tonight. With that, it's important to note that this is being broadcast on various social media platforms and being recorded. So please be mindful of that as you ask personal questions or as you leave comments. At the end of the day, we are all here to support one another. We encourage your questions and we're really just so glad that you're here with us tonight in community. Um, so we, I, I see we have a couple more folks coming in. We have, oh, we have Brazil, we have Arizona. So it looks like we have a, a good crew here tonight. Um, so let's let's go ahead and get started. Um, for those of you that I don't know, I'll introduce myself really quick and then I'll introduce our awesome guest tonight. Um, I am Katie O'Dunn. Um, I am an ordained minister and a school chaplain. Katie is perfectly fine to call me, but I always put the reverend on here in streams just to continue to destigmatize the idea of clergy and mental health, acknowledging that I am a minister and I have OCD and that's okay. Um, I do a lot of our faith and mental health initiatives at the IOCDF. I'm an ultra marathon runner. And um, this particular topic tonight is really important to me because I work with students at schools each and every day. And I'm really excited that we're going to be talking specifically as a part of our back to school um, kind, of, kind of series on BFRBs in schools. So I'm going to introduce you to some of our great guests tonight. Oh, and we also have Southern California. We have Newport Beach, California, South Louisiana. So we are, we are going all over. This is awesome. So hopefully um, some good questions coming in tonight. So Lauren, we are so excited to have you. I know many of you have probably seen Lauren on Instagram with all of the awesome things that she's doing. She's a silent sufferer turned adamant advocate um, of dermatillomania, founding the only nonprofit dedicated to skin picking disorder, the Picking Me Foundation in 2016. 
As Picking Me's CEO and a former skin picking sufferer, Lauren stands for dermatillomania awareness, support, resources, and community. She is an award-winning mental health advocate who encourages sufferers to choose themselves over the mental illness that chose them by hashtag, hashtag picking me over skin picking. I love your Instagram. I know a lot of folks that are watching tonight love your Instagram and all of the things that you do that are so inspiring. So thank you for, for being on the stream and for your willingness to be so authentic with your story. And then we have... Dr. Ruth Goldfinger Gollum, who is a senior clinician, supervisor, and a co-director of the training program at the Behavior Therapy Center of Greater Washington, where she's worked since the mid-1980s. Ms. Gollum specializes in treatment of anxiety disorders in children and adults. She has conducted numerous workshops and seminars and participated as an expert in panel discussions covering many topics, including Tourette syndrome, obsessive compulsive disorder, trichotillomania, and providing cognitive behavior therapy for anxious adults. In addition to publishing articles for professional journals and newsletters, Ms. Golem is an author of The Hair Pulling Habit and You, How to Solve Trichotillo Trichotillomania Puzzle, a book describing the comprehensive treatment of trichotillomania in children, and Stay Out of My Hair, and a parent guide to hair pulling disorder, effective parenting strategies for children with trichotillomania. Books designed all to educate, guide, and support parents of children with trichotillomania. Ms. Gollum is also the author of Psychological Interventions for Children with Sensory Dysregulation and Helping Your Child with Sensory Regulation. She's a member of the Scientific Advisory Board for the TLC Foundation for BFRBs. So we have some awesome guests here tonight with super, super impressive bios that were kind of hard to say, but that's okay. <laughs> and um, I'm just, just really excited and um, so proud of the wonderful work that y'all are doing in advocacy. So as we start to get into um, our topic, again, our topic tonight, we are focused on BFRBs specifically as we head back to school. Um, but we would encourage you to put anything in the chat relating to anxiety, OCD, back to school, BFRBs, really anything that, that you want to ask, um, because we have um, someone with great expertise here, as well as someone with great expertise and experience. So um, we would love to answer as many questions as possible. So go ahead and start loading up those questions. Um, and I'm going to start asking a few of my own as we get into this. Um, so I would just love to, um, to go ahead and start with you, Ruth, if that's okay. And um, I would love to ask when we're talking about BFRBs for anyone here who, who doesn't know, what does that mean? Um, what does that look like? And how does that relate to what the IOCDF does? Right. Well, um, uh, BFRB stand for body focused repetitive behaviors, and they're a constellation of behaviors that um, that people do repetitively. They include hair pulling, skin picking, biting the nails, um, picking at cuticles, picking a, a nose or, or biting the inside of your cheek. Those are all called body focused repetitive behaviors. Now we all do those behaviors. Everybody does those behaviors. It rises to the point where it's a um, challenging behavior when it's done repeatedly and someone feels like they don't have control over their behavior and it interferes with their ability to function um, throughout their, their normal day. So, um, so that's, that's what the, that's what body focused repetitive behaviors are. And the reason we've always been, um, cousins with, um, obsessive compulsive disorder, um, when the DSM five came out, which it was, I think in 2013, it became part of what they call obsessive compulsive related disorders. So it's under that umbrella. And we're in the same family as um, obsessive compulsive disorder, but the function of the behavior for uh, body focused repetitive behaviors is different than the function of the behavior when someone has obsessive compulsive disorder. And that's what the distinction is. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, I'm excited to ask more about that. I have lots of, of questions personally, so we'll, we'll dive into that um, in, in just a second. Um, but first I wanted to, to ask Lauren, now that we have a little bit of a definition of what BR, BFRBs are for anyone who's watching, Lauren, what is what was your, your experience? Do you mind sharing a little bit about your personal story um, about growing up with skin picking disorder, about really what that looked like for you? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for me, uh, I started picking when I was probably around five years old. And we know this because there are some photographs of me just um, lined up with other kids in swimsuits uh, during summertime with all these red polka dots just all over my skin. And it really was from bug bites that I would just keep scratching and scratching. And sometimes they'd last till about Christmas time. And um, as I continued to grow up, the behavior stuck with me um, and it really uh, showed itself, um, you know, really any chance it could, um, especially as uh, I started to go through puberty and had acne, which gave me a bunch of different triggering areas to pick at. And skin picking really kind of defined every angle of my life um, continuing to grow up. Um, in school, I was uh, misdiagnosed for self-harming. Um, in college, I was uh, reported to a counselor for using meth for the way that my skin had looked, even though I wasn't um, familiar with meth. Um, and it really just followed me. And uh, it really identified, it was how I identified was as um, something that was bad and couldn't um, be fixed. Uh, and it really was game changing, changing to get a diagnosis. Um, and that was right after uh, when Ruth mentioned in 2013, the DSM-5, including um, excoriation disorder or dermatillomania, as I, as I came to know it um, uh, in the DSM-5, um, which allowed for me to get diagnosed. And I felt like I had a, all these parts of me I had chipped away back, you know, coming back. Um, and I felt armed with, um, with something going forward uh, that I could say that I had it and it didn't have me. And that really changed my life and my experience with the disorder and has led to where I am today. I love that. And, and um, I can relate in so many ways while our journeys are different with OCD to um, the piece of being able to have a name for it and being able to say, oh, wait, I'm not defined by this thing. And there is legitimate um, treatment. There are legitimate ways for, for me to navigate this and to live a beautiful life. And I can't imagine how tough that was for you to go through those stages where folks didn't, didn't know what that looked like and almost shamed you for what that looked like. And that's, that's really, that's really hard. So I'm glad that you're advocating for others who might be going through the same things. Ah, uh, thank you. I appreciate that. So we, we started to talk about um, the kind of classification um, I know of, of what this, of what this looks like. So I'd love to hear Ruth, if you could talk a little bit more about, I know it's a related disorder to OCD. If you could talk a little bit more about kind of the distinction as well as the treatment. Okay, so the, the distinction is, um, it's an interesting distinction. It's again, the function of the behavior. When someone has obsessive compulsive disorder, they will often have a, uh, a feared thought and engage in a behavior, let's just use hand washing for the moment, in order to rid themselves of the feeling and quiet the anxiety. That's the function of the, of the ritual. With, with BFRBs, it's, it's a different function. They're, usually with BFRBs, there is no obsessional theme or there's no fear that, um, that is driving the behavior. And very often there is something about the behavior that actually um, sensorily feels good. So it's, it's a behavior that people are uh, attracted to in order to gain something from it, which is very different from the experience of someone who engages in a ritual. So, so that's, that's the, um, the different classification. Interestingly, when we started in the late 70s and early 1980s, when we were starting to, to really become more familiar with BFRBs, we, um, we did do the treatment with, uh, with the treatment for obsessive compulsive disorder is exposure and response prevention. And um, we tried that with uh, a number of people who came into our office and found that it just was not that successful. So, um, so what we did is we really uh, looked at the behavior in great detail. And my colleague, Dr. Charles Mansueto, spent a lot of time looking at the, um, the behavior itself. And we, we talked a lot about it and developed a, a treatment that really looks at 
the multiple facets of the behavior, the uh, sensory aspects, the uh, cognitions, which are different than the fears that one has with obsessive compulsive disorder, the affect or the feelings that go along with uh, body focused repetitive behaviors, the motor movements, and also the environments that one finds themselves in. And we developed a treatment plan that really is, um, is individualized and unique for every person and tries to capture multiple facets of the behavior because we really see the behavior as being a very complex behavior. And I think it's very easy to um, assume it's a simple behavior and it just needs to stop. And what happens is um, it, people find that, that that thought process is not uh, successful and therefore treatment's not successful because it's not a simple behavior. It's, uh, it's a multifaceted behavior and we really have to understand that well for every person what is driving the behavior or what uh, combination of things are driving the behavior and how can we meet those needs better? In the treatment for body-focused repetitive behaviors, we really try to meet the body's needs in different ways. So rather than simply saying, don't do the behavior, we're saying, what does your body need and how can we meet those needs differently? That's, that's so interesting and especially that exposure and response prevention, which I'm more familiar with, was something that you all tried initially, and that it's because there's such a, a different backing to this to begin with, that it's it's almost the opposite of kind of what you're doing. You're actually figuring out what do you need. So I, I wonder, um, just a follow-up question, Ruth, what is what does that journey typically look like for people? How do you discover what it is that they need and what it is to be doing in place of those things? What, is that, what does that look like? Well, it, it looks like therapy. You know, um, we we do a we do a lot with therapy. Um, spend a lot of time working with with people and um, and helping them uh, under, understand understand uh, the the behavior differently. That's the first thing, and hopefully have a somewhat different relationship with the behavior, and um, and and then understand if they uh, can work with our. Um, template, if you will, um, and help and, and then uh, help them work themselves with that. We, we've written actually some self-help books also with this particular model, which is called the comprehensive behavioral model to, to help people work with that. But it's really understanding the behavior well and then, um, and then working with uh, awareness, self-awareness, um, acceptance, and then uh, being able to really uh, do a lot of uh, uh, trial and error or embracing the process and, and working with how, um, how it works to see what works best. And it's usually a combination of things. One thing, which I know is highly appealing to people, but one thing is just not gonna be effective. We need, we need a comprehensive um, treatment plan and um, and that really really works well. Therapy, of course, I'm biased. Of course, I think therapy is is um, is is the the most effective way to go. But we also realize that um, that it's hard to find good trained therapists across the country and in different places. So there are books that can help guide somebody through this process. The, one of the things that therapy can do, though, um, as, as Lauren mentioned, and I know Lauren's you know, just a terrific advocate, and she had such a, a, a powerful experience herself, but shame um, is really part of the, um, the, the experience for many people. And being able to interact with somebody who is non-judgmental and very accepting can, can do a lot to help with um, with the shame process. And that's that's part of what therapy helps with as well. Thank you, thank you so much. And I see a lot of great questions are, are coming up. So we're gonna dive into those in, in just a second. Um, so keep loading them into the chat and we'll make sure that we get to all of them tonight. Um, but first, I, I just wanted to ask Lauren, based on what we're, we're talking about with treatment, can you say a little bit more about what your treatment journey looked like for you? Um, and how did you move from maybe the place that, that you were um, to really the awesome advocacy position that you're in now? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, I, you know, when I was first diagnosed, I remember I was handed um, a stress ball. 
And I was like, okay, now what? <laughs> you know, I, I, I didn't, I didn't understand how that was going to help with my skin picking. Um, and it really was a, a process and a journey. And a lot of what Ruth was talking about, about this, like willingness to try on different things to really have, um, not just a tool belt, um, but like tool belts, like so of, of things that to try and kind of, um, changing my mindset from, uh, treating what I was doing as fixing myself to treating it as research on this disorder. And that really, um, it made it more fun for me. It made logging, um, uh, which I did do for my treatment. Um, I, I turned it into, I felt like I was conducting the most important science experiment. And, uh, you know, it was something I could kind of get behind and, um, and do. Uh, and as I saw some progress and I got a taste of it, I only wanted more. And it really led to me um, sharing my story, finding people out there struggling just as I did, um, us coming together and then sharing our experiences, which in what Ruth was saying, um, so much of what you can get out of therapy, of course, is true. I'd also say in support group, because there's something so powerful of meeting someone who has thought the thoughts that you have thought uh, I mean, it gives me goosebumps just thinking of my people in my support group right now. Um, and and so I think in starting support groups, I started the first skin picking support group online, um, the first one um, up in Chicago, and uh, and really nurturing this community of connection and making yourself matter um, has been what's helped me reach this level of advocacy and community today. Mm -hmm. I, you're just so awesome. I wish that, you know, the platform we're using isn't like Zoom. I was like looking for the heart button to put a heart up in the corner because just what you're saying is is so is so powerful and, and just really creating that space in, in community for others based on what you went through. So how did that translate into like, OK, I'm going to start a foundation? <laughs> Yes, yes, <laughs> it's a great question. You know, <laughs> um, it it really was. Um, I first came across uh, the TLC Foundation, which at the time was um, the Trichotil Trichotillomania Learning Center, and it was the closest to home I'd ever felt, and um, it really inspired me to really give that kind of landing space, that that super big hug to. Um, just the dermatillomania community and help elevate their platform. So really, and just hearing more people stick their hand up and say, oh my gosh, that's me too. I picked two. Um, I felt like I was building this little army and we got louder and um, had more ideas. And, and, you know, if I could say anything about the BFRB community, it's that we are a passionate group of people. And when we come together, we make things happen. And and that's really what did take take um, take uh, control. Um, so and it was suggested that this should be a uh, 501c3. I went through the process and I'm happy to say um, I am now a, a nonprofit founder, you know, and I did, never thought that would be the case, but um, maybe my purpose picked me. So. <laughs> oh, I love that. Okay. That's awesome. <laughs> well, I think this is, this is a great, and I have questions I could ask y'all all night because I just think this is, uh, y'all are both amazing and fascinating, but I'm going to dive into some of the questions on here because I know we have folks who are watching um, both for their own experience and for the experience of families, particularly around, around the school topic. Um, so I'm going to go back to um, Lilith at 710, who asked, what are some good fidgets for adults, particularly that are good to bring to work? Um, and I would expand that to say I, adults, but also um, with the school piece, maybe both adults and, and students. How might that look different? Um, what does that look like maybe for, um, for your clients, Ruth? Well, it, it, that's an excellent question. And people ask that all the time. Um, I would say one of the things I would just say a caveat to is, um, as Lauren has said, and I think it's such a great point, you know, she was handed a, a, a kush ball and told to squeeze it. And she was like, what, what is this supposed to do? Not one item is going to be 
adequate or satisfying for every one person. And everybody has different experiences. So you have to understand what it is that you're, I'm back to what your body's asking for. So sometimes people, for example, who really like the feeling of, um, you know, picking at something because they like how it feels under their nails or between their fingers, having pieces of Velcro to, um, to peel and, and go back might be just the thing. Whereas somebody else um, might have a smooth stone because they like the, they like the way the smoothness feels. Um, somebody else might, might really like the kush ball because they like the, um, the individual strings on them. So it's, it's a little different for, for every person. If you're an adult, I would suggest looking into um, what they call desk toys, because there are certain things that can provide sensory input that are appropriate for office spaces. And, um, and then that becomes something that can be easily used and also displayed, because a lot of times when you put something away, it's hard to remember to take it back out. And we want these, um, these uh, strategies or, or fidgets to be readily available. With kids, a lot of times, see, I, I'm, I'm older, so I can say back in the day when we used to use pencil and pens all the time, you know, having a pencil cozy or, or something that to put on the, uh, the end of a pen that had some texture to it can be ideal for school. Nowadays, it's a little harder to do that, but that's where um, some schools can be great about that. Again, having little little kush balls um, or little balls that um, that have some give to it when you squeeze it together um, might be might be really helpful. the The other thing to think about, strangely enough, are um, kitchen items because they have some very interesting textures. So um, the small sponges, which are, they have silicone sponges or uh, mushroom brushes or things that actually can fit in your palm of your hand might be something that might be easy, easy to, to take to school. But I would just say, I'm gonna go back to one size in this particular situation really does not fit all. And that's where someone needs to experiment and determine what is, um, is useful. So do we wanna get something that is going to feel good on the fingertips or do we want something that's gonna be sort of a sensory distraction, if you will? So it provides some sensory input and it distracts you from the urge to pick or pull and, and you'd have to determine what the, what the purpose might be. But there are lots of really fascinating and clever things out there. And as Lauren mentioned, and I couldn't agree more, you know, getting involved in a group or an online group is a great idea, not just to, which is so important, to have a community and meet people that are similar to you, but also get great ideas and also share your great ideas with people. Absolutely. Thank you. And thank you for, for pulling in that school piece too. I know I shared, I'm an, I'm an educator and I'm always kind of trying to figure out what that looks like. And I know you mentioned the pencil and, and paper thing, but that's still really similar to what some of my primary school, um, school students, students are using what you might think of on the back of pencils and um, I know that we used to often have, even in the, um, even in our upper school before COVID was a thing, we would have Play-Doh and things like that readily available, even for the upper school students just to grab. I used to always keep, again, before COVID, things of Play-Doh at the front of my classroom for kids to grab if they, if they needed it. Um, COVID kind of shifted that because kids don't want to cheer Play-Doh, but it's, <laughs> you know. So I wonder, I wonder, Lauren, what, what about for you? What are, what are maybe some favorite fidgets that you like that you might, um, might recommend to both adults and to kids? Yeah, some favorite fidgets. Oh, I love this topic. Um, so, you know, something right now that I could at least say um, I'd recommend for the workspace or the school space um, are called calm strips. They are sensory adhesives uh, that come in smooth and bumpy fashions that you can um, uh, ad adhere and stick onto different locations. But what's important about um, what they allow and what I have to say about fidgets in general, how to best make them work, is that um, it's really about finding out where you need that fidget and then 
making that fidget have one job, one home, one purpose. So if I'm someone who is, while I'm studying, I notice that my hands are kind of scanning and wandering my body. Maybe I can adhere my um, comm strip to my journal that I'm writing on so that I have something to rub while I'm reading through some pages. So I'm giving it just that one job, that one home and one purpose. Um, or for example, my tangle um, I use during Zoom calls. And um, what helps me with this one job, one home, one purpose is uh, he's always on the keyboard. So if I leave, go to the bathroom, grab something, I put him on the keyboard. When I come back, instead of my hands starting to again, look for some perceived imperfection to fix, the first thing I have to do is pick it up. So my hands just have to start wandering here while I continue thinking up here. So I think um, really taking fidgets on with that kind of mindset has been helpful. And yes, really uh, um, to what Ruth said about being trying as many as possible, really finding the textures um, and the different sensory inputs that work for you. Um, and and to know that they're, it's not just tactile. Uh, with fidgets, sometimes there's something um, auditory I find that I'm craving. Um, from past picking experiences, sometimes if I'd be stuck close up to the mirror, I might not feel like I achieved it or finished it until I heard a pop or heard something hit the mirror. So now when I use this thing called a wacky track and I hear that click, click, pop, while I'm having my think time or something, um, I kind of get something out of that that I let myself enjoy. Uh, and, you know, I'd also say just for any beginners in fidgets, um, for all those who, are, you know, just want to get their feet wet um, and what's out there um, at Picking Me, we do put together a fiddle pack full of 25 mm -hmm. different fidgets um, that range from uh, cur being curated by the community, um, ranging from fake grapes to tangles, uh, stress balls, finger covers, pipe cleaners. So just something you could check out in the future. And we also donate one for each one we sell. So just something to look um, up in the future. I love that. We'll have to we'll have to put the link out there because I think that's that's really awesome and it might really help a lot of folks that are watching tonight. So thank you. Um, so I wonder we have Mike now at seven fifteen, um, and Mike has a question: Have had picking and biting of fingers, thumbs, lips for decades. Seven years ago, I went on a cruise for a week after my hands were healed. Um, since then, I started again, but only my thumbs. Is this 100% stress related? Um, so what do you think? Do you have any responses to this, Ruth? Yes, and I would say um, it is really common for people to assume it is 100% stress related. But one of the things that we found is that um, many people pick um, a, a, or pull for a variety of different reasons. Um, even within the same day. Sometimes when someone might be um, waking up in the morning, they're thinking about their day and they're just kind of organizing their thoughts and they may find themselves engaging in the behavior. They're not really stressed at that point. They're just trying to organize their, their thinking. There are other times where someone might be in the car driving to work and they are feeling stressed about the upcoming day. They might be on the computer waiting for an answer for something and they might actually find themselves being bored and find themselves engaging in the behavior. I've had people who say, you know, in states of indecision, sometimes um, actually real happiness, um, boredom, stress, there are a variety of different feelings. Being sad or down certainly can be part of it as well. So um, it's really the human experience, um, actually, and it's it's a variety of different feelings. And it's it's not always the same feeling throughout the day that might trigger that um, that behavior. So it's really important to spend some time, as as Lauren said, being a very good scientist about yourself and really looking at your behavior with sort of some um, some scientific dispassion, if you will, and just, just documenting it and trying to find out what's actually going on. As, as uh, Lauren also said, you know, the sensory experience can be any of our senses. It can be um, auditory, can have something oral. Uh, some people like smelling things, um, 
uh, just uh, feeling things um, and touching things, and also the sight, feeling at the sight itself may um, may engage some of the behavior. So you really have to um, have a, take a broad view and really look at it. It is it is a not an uncommon common story for people to say that they um, they had an experience where they stopped picking or pulling for a period of time. And as Mike has mentioned, being on a um, being on vacation can be one of those. Definitely lack of stress is part of that. But the other thing you have to take into consideration is lack of your usual routine. When you are in your usual routine, you are not really thinking about all of the things that you that you need to do. Like you you go by rote about your toothbrush and tooth, putting toothpaste on and just brushing your teeth and things like that. When you're on vacation, you have to remember where did I put my toothbrush? Where is my toothpaste? Where are things? So you're you're putting thought to things that you don't normally put thought to, and it crowds out, if you will, sometimes the BFRB behavior because you're thinking about and focused on other things. Um, it is possible if you stayed on that cruise for a long, long period of time, you might find that the BFRB starts coming back because you're now developing a routine and you're, you're in a routine that allows that behavior to emerge again. So we just, we just have to think pretty broadly about this, but there are some very good ways of, of working on it. And, and again, Lauren's point about, um, you know, items, we call them strategies, um, interventions, the fidgets and things, they live in one place, really is extraordinarily helpful so that you don't have to be searching for things in different environments. And also different environments might, um, you might engage different sensations, different emotions, different different um, interventions in different environments as well. And that's why having certain interventions in every single environment really does help. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you, you, so Thank you so much. And um, I, I wanted to just go over to Lauren. I saw you nodding your head about, about a lot of that. Did you have anything you wanted to add to that question? Oh, I mean, I just agree with everything that Ruth's been saying, especially about the routine um, element uh, and was going to suggest that that when we shake up our routine, we can really uh, shake up these behaviors. I remember one time I moved this mirror, right? When you walk into my apartment, my old apartment, there was this mirror on the right. And every time I'd walk home, I would always turn to that mirror just to check to see what's up. And uh, I was like, I'm going to move this mirror straight across the room. And I, and I did it. And I was super proud. And I would come home and I would still always turn uh, to that mirror, to that location. And um, in that, you know, really just taking that in and just noticing that really um, taught me a level of awareness that I could feel and sense. And again, something that I just wanted then more of. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I would also say with um, the uh, strategies Ruth mentioned, um, yes, the fidgets are super important. Another um, element or thread of strategies I would suggest are kind of barriers or blockers. And with barriers or blockers, you still same approach um, are implementing them into your environment, into your trigger areas, but they look more like um, okay, if I notice I am a skin picker in my bathroom because, you know, it's well lit and there's mirrors and I can be alone and investigate um, what can I do to change that entire experience. Maybe I put sunglasses right before my door of my bathroom and I have to wear shades in the bathroom just to dull the light a little or have the faucet running to give me a timer of how long I'm allowed to stay by how much water I'm willing to waste. Um, or uh, writing love notes to myself on the mirror or splashing water on the sink so that I don't want to lean in and get wet. Really setting up this kind of obstacle course, if you will, to kind of keep me um, from uh, doing the work that I know I don't need to do, but um, end up doing quite often. Um, 
So yeah, I, I would just say just and and knowing that it's okay that that if your if your um environment looks different because of that, if you have to carry sunglasses to your bathroom at school or at work, or if you um come home and you invite friends over and your toothbrush is at your kitchen sink because you don't brush your teeth in your bathroom because that's too triggering, so you do it at your sink. Awesome, ten points. So I just want people to know that that's okay to have that happen and shake up your life like that. Thank you. Thank you for that affirmation, Lauren. Um, I want to now go to Lisa at 7.15. And um, this is this is a comment, but I, I really want to turn this into, into a question. Um, it says, I have OCD and also bite my nails in the inside of my mouth. So I know we said that, um, that this is a related disorder, but do we also see this with folks with OCD? And if that's the case, um, is exposure and response prevention still a part of that? Does the treat are the treatments separate? What is what does that look like, Ruth? Well, I think we're still going to go back to what's the function of the behavior. If someone has a fear that something awful is going to happen, um, if they don't bite the inside of the mouth, then that's functioning like a ritual. If there's no fear associated and it's just like, oh, I have this, you know, this tag on the inside of my mouth and I, I just feel like I just have to chew it, then it's a BFRB. So we have to look at what the function of the behavior is. And let me also just say that there, there is a role for exposure and response prevention with BFRBs. It's just not the sole treatment. Okay. So um, because one of the things that when you have a BFRB, it is useful to understand and be compassionate with yourself and um, and understand that urges are going to come, and they might they might hit you when you're less prepared. So the idea of tolerating that urge until you can get something is um, is useful. That's a useful that's a useful idea. And um, and what Lauren was saying before about barriers again couldn't agree more. Let's think collectively also with the idea that if you're using barriers you still will want to use some sensory item or maybe several several sensory items. So we don't use one category or the other. We combine them. We also might do some relaxation techniques if, if we're feeling really um, keyed up at the time um, or, or deep breathing or meditation. There are, um, at the same time, we have the water running and we've got something in our hands. There are lots of things that, that can be done. Interestingly, with, um, with nail biting and biting the inside of, of your mouth, we have to be really creative with these kinds of, um, these kinds of uh, strategies to help. So with the inside of the mouth, we might try different things, like we might try um, chewing gum so that you're chewing something, but it's not, it's not the inside of your mouth. Or you might try sucking on a, a hard candy rather than chewing so that it's not the inside of your mouth. You might try, there's some wax that you can get that, that helps kids with braces. They put the wax over the brace so that their lip doesn't catch the brace. Well, you can try that on the inside of your, your cheek so that your, your teeth don't catch your cheek. So there are lots of things that we need to be, we need to think about, we need to think creatively, um, but, but I know I'm getting a little bit uh, far away. The question is, is it OCD and can you do exposure and response prevention? I'm going to go back to the function of the behavior. We have to understand that it is it is not uncommon for people who have OCD to also um, coexist, have coexisting body focused repetitive behaviors. Um, I've treated many people with both and you treat them both differently. But again, you have to understand what the function of the behavior is. Thank you. That's that's super helpful. And I see that Mike just told us at 742 that these are amazing answers that he never would have thought of some of these things. So, so thank you so much. And this is this is this is really great so far. So I want to keep we have a ton of questions. I want to keep moving through and um, I want to jump back to um, Austin Peterson at 715. Um, and this is really a school related question. My daughter, age nine, picks at school, but has tried to hide it well until this year. Her peers and teachers have noticed, and she's become very upset that other people know. Any tips on how to talk to her about not being ashamed and what she can tell her peers and her teachers? So Lauren, I know that you've been been through this, maybe in your own life, and, and I wonder what advice you might give. Yes. Well, 
first of all, I love this little girl so much already. Just want to say, and um, I'd, I'd share uh, one thing that I've seen kind of be fun is turning something that I had to do into something fun to do. So um, maybe if the picking area is coverable by a Band-Aid and there's a certain brand of Band-Aid that's cool, like, I, mean, I don't know what's cool really right now, but um, a certain kind of cool Band-Aid that she'd be into and maybe um, asking a friend of hers uh, if they'd wear these together, just kind of like friendship Band-Aids and roping someone in and making it a, um, an activity uh, about friendship and love and not an activity about um, covering up the bad behavior. Um, I think that that might be something to help with at least it being pointed out. Um, also bringing resources to um, teachers or um, you, you know students even or other parents um, about skin picking or BFRBs is, is super helpful um, just to be armed with education. Uh, and I'd say um, showing off the fidget collection at nine. Um, I think that fidgets are something um, in, in school, bringing a different um, kind of fiddle kit, if you will, and bringing different fidgets um, as kind of a, a show and tell and way to embrace that this is just a part of me. Um, those might be things that I, I wish I did when I was little. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Austin, I hope your, your daughter sees this and sees that she is not alone and, and that, that she is awesome and that there's so many things that, that she can, she can do. Um, I, I also wonder as a part of this, you mentioned the, the teacher component and, and um, Ruth, you might be able to, to speak to this. Um, a lot of times in these streams around students, we talk about kind of classroom accommodations and things like that. Are there particular things that teachers can be doing to support? Are there particular things that teachers can look for? Again, not, um, I know Austin's talking about his daughter maybe feeling some level of, of shame. How can teachers offer support without making the students feel uncomfortable? Great question. Let me start out by saying, in general, the schools are filled with very caring adults who really want to help. Teachers are there to help your kids, and that's, that is really what they want to do. Um, they're also under a fair amount of stress, and nowadays more than ever because of getting back into school and with COVID and everything that's been going on, it is really tough. One of the things that is particularly difficult for teachers is when they become aware that there's a problem and they don't understand the problem because then they're going to be left to their own devices to try to solve the problem because that's what teachers try to do. So I would say, first of all, if a teacher is aware that this is going on, it's really going to be helpful and supportive for the teacher, for the parent to go in and educate the teacher about what BFRBs are. Um, I've seen it in schools before where teachers, and I really think they're well-meaning, they're really trying, make the automatic assumption that the kid is stressed, and then they want to reduce the stress, so they put the child in a lower class. So now you have a, a child who's bright, and they're bored, and they're still engaging in the behavior that they were engaging in before, because we don't know that stress is, is um, it might be one of the triggers, but it's not the only trigger. So, um, so... When, with parents who have some strategies at home that are working for them, they want to, if they're gonna um, inform the school, they also want to be specific in asking the school to do something. So that might be that my, my child functions better when she wears a hat and there's a no hat policy at school. Can we get a special accommodation for my child to wear a hat? That um, my child uh, wears Band-Aids on her fingers because it, it interferes with her uh, automatic ability to feel the hair or to pick her skin. Um, and having a supply of, having the teacher have an extra supply of Band-Aids would be very helpful as an accommodation, for example. Having, um, having fidgets in the desk, having extra um, body movements might be helpful. So maybe the daughter could be the person who passes out papers in the, um, in the classroom or is the runner to the office to go give messages to the office so the child gets a chance to get up and out of her, her seat on a regular basis. Um, if a child is feeling very um, self-conscious, 
it is it's a tough it's a tough situation and i think we want to we want to really um support that child in that way um there are some kids i've seen kids who have taken this task of uh, deciding that they're going to make a science report and report to the class on uh, what what uh, hair pulling or skin picking is and isn't, and that's their way of, of informing the class. Other times, kids don't want to don't want to do that, so maybe they could be separated from the class while the teacher talks to the class about what skin picking is or isn't and how to support the child. Um, there, so there are ways of doing that. If a child really does not want anybody to know, they might choose a special friend, as Lauren said, as um, as a confidant. But maybe they're going to come up with some um, some uh, reasonable excuse, if you will, for why their their skin looks this, the way that they it does, or their hair uh, is is uh, sparse in places. They have an allergic reaction. They're going to a, a. They have a skin condition, and they're going to a doctor for it. Those things are are not completely inaccurate, but they're also not completely accurate. And sometimes kids are not quite ready to tell the full story, and they need to have a way of of talking about it that keeps their um, their privacy, if that's what kids want to keep. But we we want to help your child, so we don't want it to be so private that your child's not not helping themselves in the classroom. So we want to we want to make sure that that gets balanced um, as as best as possible. And I see Katie looks like she has um, she has left for a moment. So let me let me also mention that um, that there are some articles on the TLC Foundation website, TLC Foundation for Body Focused Repetitive Behaviors. There are there are articles for children getting back to school, and it's called, I think, a backpack of strategies for kids getting back to school. And they have some um, ideas of what kids can do. And there are also some articles for professionals, for teachers in um, in the school system, of of do's and don'ts, things that are supportive, things that can be helpful, and um, and and things to try to stay away from at the same time. So those things might be helpful and might be helpful for parents to read as well because they can best help this school in that way. Thank you so much. And and um, it kicked me off for just a second, but I'm I'm glad to be back. And I know that everyone was in great hands with with all of your with all of your knowledge and. I know for me, um, I got ninety percent of that. And hearing for, as a teacher, um, this was this was really helpful as a teacher and a chaplain. And I appreciate your note that, um, especially with COVID, we really are doing the best we can. But sometimes there just aren't the right um, the right tools that are that are present. And it sounds like um, you know Austin continued with some of the other things that his his daughter's navigating. And I hope that um, some of these tools and even some of the accommodations that you talked about can be can be really helpful. Um, so I want to bring up, um, Alexandra asked a really interesting question at 716. Um, how does dissociation accompany skin picking? Um, and I wonder, Ruth, if you might speak to that. Well, I think that it, one of the things that we want to be very aware of is that, as I said, one size does not fit all. Dissociation does not always coexist with skin picking, but it certainly can. And people will talk about engaging in the behavior sometimes, whether it's hair pulling or skin picking, and they get into something sort of like a trance. So it's that it's that repetitive behavior that you get into and, and sort of shut out the rest of the rest of the world, and um, and that's where we're back to trying to really understand all of the facets um, that uh, of of the behavior itself and of, of the skin picking and how to keep yourself uh, present during uh, during um, the behavior, whatever whatever um, situation you're in, whether you're watching TV or or on the computer or. Um, or whatever you're doing, how to really work on keeping yourself present so that that, uh, that trance-like state or disassociation becomes um, less present. But uh, I'd also be interested to hear what, what Lauren has to say 
Um, but I, but I just, I just would uh, again say one size does not fit all, and it's not always, it doesn't always accompany, but it's not uncommon to accompany the skin picking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead, Lauren, jump in. Yeah, well, I, I would agree with Ruth um, again, and and say what I, what I see, and the way I describe it as breaking down skin picking at least as two different types of episodes. So focused versus scanning. And in doing so, and in talking to support group members about this, uh, I really find that there's a whole scale like a, um, of how people identify 50, 50 scanning, 50 or 50 scanning, 50 focused or any combination. And what I mean by the focused and scanning is focus being you're passing your hallway mirror, you see something out of the corner of your eye, cut to your fixed, um, you're stuck fixing this perceived imperfection for hours, whereas scanning is more this dissociation, this I'm watching TV, I'm driving, and my hand is kind of wandering, and holy shoot, I look down and I found blood there. Um, and and I think that that's what one of the things that makes this disorder so um, interesting to understand uh, is that there's seems to there's sometimes intent behind what we're doing, but there's sometimes a not meaning to be doing it at all in a zone um, with these repetitive behaviors of my body literally doing the actions um, almost as if they have a mind of their own. So uh, in seeing that there's different ways um, to break down the episodes, it's important to have different strategies for them. So specifically for disassociating or scanning picking, it's a lot like what Ruth was saying about um, staying present or at least bringing yourself to the present. Mm -hmm. What I found is um, for my wandering fingers, it's not a fidget at that moment that's gonna be helpful. If you tell me I'm picking and then put it in my hand, okay, maybe I have stopped, but the damage might be done. What helps is maybe um, my hands are wandering and I don't know, so I wear a bunch of jingly bracelets and then I'm cued in when I hear the bracelets jingle or I have perfume or an essential oil rolled on my wrist or something to kind of bring me to when my hands are on for me, my trigger areas are my face and chest mainly. Um, so just really working with what your needs are and how you can have them met by um, these different strategies. Uh, and especially, yeah, I, yes, and would say that there are different levels for um, dissociation with skin picking. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I think that actually leads really well as, as we're talking about different ways to navigate so many, so many different things. Um, at 721, Matthias actually asked something that I wanted to ask earlier. So I'm really glad that it's one of our questions on here. Um, it, is ACT ever incorporated into, into treatments um, for BFRBs? Um, and I, I was wondering that. Um, Self-disclosure, I'm in a uh, doctoral intensive right now that we're fully focused on ACT this whole week. So as y'all have been talking, I've been thinking about, okay, how does this maybe fit into what we're doing? Is ACT a potential treatment or a second line treatment? Um, so, so Ruth, um, is ACT ever incorporated? Yes, ACT is acceptance and commitment therapy. And, um, and it's, a, it's a, a whole form of therapy uh, in and of itself. And, um, and it's, a, it's a wonderful uh, addition if, if need be. As, as, as I talked before, there's a whole area of, um, of triggers for the behavior that have to do with how you, what you're feeling. Um, and again, those feelings can be um, can be happy feelings, sad feelings, uh, depressed, uh, stressed, uh, indecision. It can be a, a variety of feelings. If if you find that those definitely overtake you at times, and um, and it's hard to figure out what to do, except acceptance and commitment therapy strategies can be very effective and helpful in those circumstances. And it fits within the model that, um, that we use for treatment times. Um, you know, there are all sorts of uh, strategies and skills that are, are uh, possible to use. And what we want to do is, as I said before, find the right package that's going to work. I would say um, act is wonderful. It is not necessary for every single person that picks or and or pulls, but um, but it may be very helpful 
for uh, for some people and essential for for some others. So so we really want to look at again the whole the whole treatment package and um, and how how that might be useful. But act acceptance and commitment therapy can be very helpful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And it looks like, you know, we have folks who are responding to this in the chat. Um, Lisa at eight o'clock says, um, I've lived most of my life with OCC, BDD, and BFRBs. Um, and I have found CBT and ACT acceptance commitment therapy to be life-saving for me personally. So I think, mm -hmm. um, and I can relate very much to that with OCD. And um, as I'm learning, ACT can fit into so many different ballparks. And I'm glad that, that it fits here as well. Lauren, mm -hmm. has ACT been something that's been helpful for you? Is that something that you've used as a part of your process? You know, personally, um, it, it has not been um, something that I just have tried or am, am, am that familiar with. But can I see and have I heard of benefits and relations to um, management and recovery with skin picking? Yes. Awesome. Thanks, Lauren. Um, Lisa at 721 says that it is very hard to find a good therapist. And um, I think that lots of folks can relate to that. Um, so I wonder for anyone who's watching, whether it's someone who is heading back to school or an adult um, looking for a therapist in this area, um, what are some tools um, and some tips that you might give? Um, uh, go ahead, Ruth. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is very hard to find a therapist. I think that's that's really a, a challenge. One of the things the TLC Foundation has been trying to do is we have not only done um, in-person trainings, which we call the Professional Training Institute, PTI, which provides um, an intensive weekend of training for professionals and also provides them with uh, continuing credits um, so it can be helpful for them and we've done that in person and trained um, hundreds of people actually across the the US but we've also uh, done a video uh, which we call the virtual uh, professional training institute and one can go can view the virtual training and get the training that is that is um, needed and then they are listed on the um, the the website, the TLC website. So if you go on the TLC website and you put in wherever, you, whether it's a school where you're gonna be at school or where you live, there will be a list of people um, in, in, hopefully in that area. And um, what you wanna look for is people who have been through the training. If you can't find somebody close to you who's been through the training, then I would suggest getting a self-help book um, that really does outline the treatment and you might bring it to a therapist who is willing to work with you with that um with the self-help book and and work on it together and if i'm lauren i'm sure you have stuff to say to this too yeah yeah thank you i thank you um if i may add it uh also to um, know that it's okay to try out a couple different therapists. You know, it's okay to meet with somebody and if it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit. That's totally fine. Um, and I also recommend asking if they have any uh, familiarity or um, connection with a local dermatologist or hair salon or cosmetologist um, or somebody, nail salon, maybe that they have a connection with that, that you can kind of help set up this team approach, this team network. Um, um, with them uh, and work on that uh, with them. Awesome. Well, so I would encourage, I know that um, Jess behind the scenes has been putting the link to the TLC Foundation in our chat. So I would encourage you to check that out. And I know as a comment to that, um, Mike at 803, and you don't need to put this up, but I just I just wanted to let Mike know, also said that it's fine, uh, hard to find a specialist who specializes in OCD. So Mike, just for you to know also, and Jess, if you're able to put this in the chat, there is um, an area of the IOCDF as well where you're able to find a specialist in your area. So we'll try to put that up for you so that you can see that too, because we definitely understand how challenging that can be to find an expert in, in all of these areas. Awesome, thank you, Jess. Um, okay. Um, so let's see, I now lost my place, so I'm going to scroll back up. Okay. Um, oh, great question. So Erica at 723, is there any relationship between deficiencies and the behaviors? I've heard that low magnesium and electrolyte imbalances may contribute. Ruth, is this, is this something that's true? Is this a factor? 
Um, you know, not that we are aware of. There's been um, there there's been research in in the area with with a lot of different um, a lot of different aspects of it, and uh, dif we've looked at deficiencies and um, have not found that that is universally an issue. That being said, I always say, you know, everybody's different. And if you think, you know, lack of magnesium, if you, if magnesium seems to help and it's, it's not unhealthy for you to take it, then that's fine. But you really want to be, even things that are over the counter, you have to be careful and make sure that your doctor approves them and that it's, it's um, a healthy supplement for you. But, um, but there has not been any, any research that supports uh, deficiencies as, as of yet. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I see after that question, we have all sorts of folks that are very excited about um, all of the advocacy that Lauren's doing and all the work that Ruth is doing. Um, I see that that Lily um, is on um, her first live stream here with us and is struggling with it, with finding a therapist. So hopefully some of these resources we've been putting up are also helpful. Um, I see at 725, we have Anonymous 100. Um, they say, my daughter picks eyebrows and eyelashes, gets a tingling sensation and feels the need to pick, often with anxiety, has OCD too. Where do I start to help? She's resistant to help. Um, Lauren, do you have any thoughts about even kind of where to start? Um, yeah, you know, one place to start, I'm not quite sure how, how old she is, but um, looking on social media to find a community, there are people out there that are experiencing and talking and sharing um, strategies and just what it's like to have those kinds of urges. So I would recommend um, maybe even creating a fake Instagram account and kind of following um, pages of people that are posting about this struggle to really relate and feel less alone. Um, that's something I remember that was one of the hardest parts growing up with my urges was just feeling so isolated by them. Um, and if it's eyebrows and eyelashes and a, and a picking, um, the goal is to pick at them, you could try barriers like um, money counters that cover your tips uh, that have perforated um, edges so that you could wear them um, and still type uh, or do homework with, you know, and hold a pen. But um, at least it'd be something to feel um, and rub and not be able to clench on the eyebrow or eye hair. Um, and I'd also recommend keeping the area, um, trigger areas um, moist. Um, I've had people have uh, good results with taking Aquaphor and um, sports headbands and actually wearing them this direction and just let, letting them kind of be there during um, your triggering moments. So again, back to kind of what we were talking about at the beginning, maybe looking first at where her um, pick, picking and pulling at the eyebrows and eyelashes is mainly happening and uh, developing which blockers, which barriers, how you can alter the environment um, based on that. Awesome, thanks, thanks Lauren. Um, and Ruth, did you have anything to add? Yes, I would say, I don't know what age this child is, but I would say what what um, is a challenge. As a parent, you love your child and you wanna help your child and you want them to do anything that you possibly can to help them. Um, but you also have to remember, it's not your behavior, it's your child's behavior. And um, one of the things that happens with kids is they feel like this behavior is wrong. And depending on the age of the child, they can also feel like they're a bad kid for, for doing this. And that becomes really hard. It's a hard feeling to have. And then it's hard to accept help because the help implies that they're bad or doing something wrong. So it may be helpful actually for parents to take a step back and just love their child, Hold, you know, hug their child, tell them that they're awesome, remind them of all the great things that they, they are and they do. And um, when they come home from school, rather than asking about what, whether they picked or pulled or where, where they did, who did they eat lunch with? How was class? You know, did they, they learn anything interesting? Take a step back. The, um, the trying to help your child can become a very big power struggle and it becomes a lose-lose proposition because um, your child could reject the help and, um, and then your child is, 
continuing to engage in the behavior and feel bad about themselves. It's valuable for your child to feel better about themselves. And like I said, taking a step back from the behavior may allow the child to, to, to get that relief and, and renew that they are a valuable member of the family, even if they pull their eyelashes and eyebrows. Um, so, so I think that's really important to just remember. Thank you. Thanks for that focus on on compassion for our families that are that are watching too, and how to how to respond. Um, I'm going to try to get through the rest of the questions, but first, I do want to note 727. Um, Ethan Smith, our national advocate, says, "Congrats on your 501c3 status, Lauren. That's awesome. Thanks for your advocacy, um, and just you're you're so supported um, by the IOCDF and by so many in this community. So we're all we're all cheering you on. So thank you so much." <laughs> So I see lots of lots of um, just how how proud folks are of you here. Um, but I'm going to jump. <laughs> no, no worries. But um, we're going to jump to our next question um, and try to hit all of them. So Don at 7:36 from Northern Virginia near DC. Um, I find it interesting that many of us with these behaviors tend to be perfectionists. I don't understand the paradox because as I pick at scabs, they become more prominent, agitated, scarred. In short, the opposite from perfect. Do we know why some of us feel some kind of temporary satisfaction from and drawn to these behaviors, even though they result, for me at least, in more anxiety about my scars and appearances? Okay, Ruth, what do you what do you think about this? Well, I think I think it's a great question and very insightful, and and I think that that is that is the conundrum of the behavior itself, and you you have to really think of sort of short term and long term goals. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take it out of the context of uh, BFRB for a moment because it it's again I'm just gonna say it's kind of a human experience. If I am trying to eat more healthfully and there's a donut in front of me, I'm more likely to eat that donut. And if I take one bite of the donut, I'm more likely to finish the donut rather than saying, I'm going to leave it alone. And then tomorrow, I'm not going to have lost any weight or I might also feel bad because I, I, um, I ate too many donuts and I'm trying, to, I'm trying to be more healthful. But in the moment, it feels good. And that is what happens with the BFRB. The uh, short-term and long-term goals tend to be at odds with each other because the short-term is the feeling. There's something appealing about that feeling. Um, and unfortunately, the, the longer term is the damage that gets done. And, um, and that, becomes, that becomes distressing and, and upsetting. And unfortunately, sometimes that very feeling of distress and upset um, sort of starts another round of uh, picking or pulling because the sensation feels good. So you get into this, you get into this loop. But I think that um, that is true for, uh, for, for some people, they, too, they can be perfectionists. And, um, and the, as I said, the short term and long term goals tend to be at odds with each other. So, so you have to tolerate the discomfort of having a scab or um, or hair growing in while you're waiting for the longer term, you know, smoother skin or or a fuller hair, and that becomes a challenge because the coping mechanism has been that sensory feeling. So it keeps the scab going, or it keeps. Um, the hair from from growing in, so that that becomes that becomes the issue. But but as I said before, and and Lauren has said too, if you really understand the behavior well, and you can meet your body's needs in different ways, and keep your goals um, in the forefront of your thinking, it can help you over that hump while you're while you're tolerating the scab or the, um, the, the hairs that are growing in so that you can achieve your, your longer term goal and meet your body's needs in a different way while you're doing it. Yeah, it's so interesting. I know we've talked about um, kind of differentiating from from OCD and there being these these core foundational pieces that are different in, in treatments that look different. But that that reminds me so much of with OCD and getting over the hump of not doing that compulsion that feels really good in that moment and having to sit with 
all of that discomfort, all of the uncertainty eventually to live into those values that are really meaningful to you. Right. Um, and often it knocks on the door a lot harder when you stop doing those things initially, but you get to that, that place long term. Um, Lauren, did you have anything else to add to this from your experience? Um, just one one thing I would add is um, I relate so much to the perfectionism ask here. And uh, what I found, though, is considering it more um, achievement based as what I've been after in my skin picking, more like goal oriented. When I look at it that way, it's helped me um, uh stop trying to fix at it or make my goal be um, perfect. Mm -hmm. So I, I've, I noticed that if I take on an area that has been a trigger and I make my goal, um, if I lift it up a little bit, but if I, my goal is just to put it back down, I have more success accomplishing that than if I made my goal, I'm not gonna touch that triggered area. Um, so uh, I think also just making in whichever way, um, whether it's take, you relate to it as perfectionism tendencies or as achievement or kind of goal-based, but really taking on um, these like mini uh, goals um, has been what's been most game-changing for me. Awesome, thank you for that, Lauren. Um, have another question for Lauren from Anonymous100 at 750. Um, I think this is a shorter question, but just do you send these fidgets to Australia? Yes, the answer is we do. We absolutely do. Um, please check out pickingme.org slash shop and we will hook you up. Okay, awesome. So it sounds like we are getting some awesome resources out there tonight. I love that. We are we are sending stuff all over. Um, okay, um, another question at 757 um, from Mateus again. Um, I wonder whether BDD and BFRBs overlap or coexist and if so, how commonly can they occur? Um, Ruth, any thoughts on this? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. And, um, and they certainly uh, can and do overlap. It is, uh, it, it's just so important that we always keep, keep an eye on, um, you know, what the behavior is so that we can make the um, distinction between BDD um, and BFRBs because we don't want to assume that all BFRBs are BDD, but some can be for sure, in which case we want to make sure that we, we um, hit it, if you will, with all the resources that we have for BDD and BFRBs. So we want to make sure that we, we, um, we you know, adequately address address the issue. How common is it? It it happens. Um, it, it does happen, um, not infrequently, but it's not. It's not a you know everybody that walks in my office has uh, has the overlapping BDD and BFRB. But um, but as I said, doing a good um, uh, a functional analysis of the behavior will really help the therapist as well as the, the client understand what the behavior is and then we can address it um, at, you know, effectively. Thank you. And um, Matthias, I know you're here listening um, about BFRBs tonight. We also have um, for Chris's Corner next Wednesday at noon, um, there's a focus on BDD. So that might be something that you wanna tune into also. Um, Lisa at 806, um, what do you recommend when you can't afford treatment? I think this is a question that a lot of, a lot of people have. Um, I know we talked about the fact that, that therapy is, is really, really important, but there are sometimes cases where there are other resources that are used. Um, Lauren, um, I'm sure you see this with folks in your advocacy. Um, what do you suggest? Yeah, absolutely. I, I would suggest looking into support groups again as um, just uh, something as a, an excellent way to connect and learn and work on your BFRB um, and even find out uh, ways to get in touch with mental health services that you might not have known before. I've had a lot of people um, learn from one another in our support group of how they can actually find a different therapist or there is someone available or it will be covered all through just meeting and connecting in our support groups. So I think looking for support groups be a great step. Um, of course, checking out our online support group at Picking Me. I know TLC, BFRB.org has great support groups as well. Um, and uh, start, and you know, there's, 
starting one on your own is a, uh, also an option or a club or an after school um, hangout or meetup just around mental health, just to, um, again, connect with and be with um, like-minded people. Um, and if you're looking for uh, starting your fidget um, exploration with your BFRB, we do offer um, donated fiddle packs um, uh, because of our buy one, sell one program. So you can always apply um, for some donated fidgets to start you off with um, at Picking Me. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, any thoughts on this, Ruth? This is our, our last question, and then we're going to get into some closing thoughts. Okay. So I, again, could not agree with Lauren more. I think I, uh, you know, self-help groups are great and there are many that are, uh, well, free and, and online these days. So I would definitely look into that. And then the other thing I would look into are, um, self-help books that might be helpful. You could, you could work through them. I'm going to say we, um, we just wrote a book, uh, last year called overcoming body focused repetitive behaviors overcoming bfrbs and um and it has skin picking and hair pulling in it um so it's it's a resource thank you thank you yeah and i can see stacy in the chat um 822 saying books help when you can't afford a therapist afford a therapist so i think many people will probably look up that book as well so um th these are just Awesome, awesome, awesome resources. And it sounds like um, anyone who's watching, you are not alone. There are so many, even just in the chat tonight, who are in the same in the same boat with you. Um, so please, please know that you are loved and, and not alone. Um, so just in, in closing thoughts, um, and I'll, I'll start with you, Ruth, anything that you would, you would like to um, just end on for anyone going back to school with BFRBs or just BFRB treatment in general, um, anything else you would like to share? Yes, I would just say, I want to remind everybody that um, this is a, um, it's a process. When you're working on a behavior, it's a process. It's not, um, it's not an event. So um, the, the old saying is, it's a, uh, what is it? It's not a sprint, it's, um, it's a marathon. And to be aware that, um, that as you work on things, you're gonna have successes and you're gonna have things that are not as successful. And you really have to embrace both of those. Understanding what doesn't work for you is as important as understanding what does work for you. And, um, and having something that doesn't work doesn't mean that you have failed. If you tried it, you, that was a success. Um, and it's really important to, to understand that and work with that and keep yourself um, as uh, up and motivated to put one foot in front of the other as possible because, because it's gonna take some time and, and to really be kind and generous and, and not hard on yourself as you go through this process. Thank you, Thank you. Ruth. Lauren, closing thoughts. Yeah, oh, that was beautiful, Ruth. But, you know, um, just to add uh, for everyone who's struggling out there, whether you picked or pulled last five minutes ago or five days ago, um, you you matter, you are valid and valued. And um, I'd offer just to be gentle with yourself after any episodes, as gentle as you can. The, these disorders already get to tear us apart and they really don't deserve a minute more of our time. Um, and I'd, I'd ask you to aim for progress over perfection, um, to keep going for those mini goals, setting these really super nugget sized mini goals and experience these mini wins and kind of live in that momentum and build on that progress because that's where happy happens. Um, and yeah, I guess I'd say the ultimate freedom, at least for me, has been choosing myself over the illness that chose me. So I'd, um, I'd hope everyone would continue to be picking me over skin picking. I don't think I can close any way better than that. So really, everybody listening, please, please pick yourself. And um, I hope you've really, really gotten that message from, from our time tonight. Um, so just a couple quick announcements. So, so don't go anywhere yet. Um, 
So there is registration right now open for the 1 million steps for OCD walk. There are 36 walks happening around the country, including the flagship walk in Boston, which will be held on September 18th. Find a walk near you and register at iocdf.org slash walk. Um, also, we are getting close. We are just a little over a month away from the online OCD conference um, taking place October 8th to 10th. Um, you can learn more and register at iocdf.org slash conference. Um, we have the, the, um, the link the going in the chat. And this is something that's, that's really neat. I know many of us miss the chance to really get together in person, but what a cool opportunity that really wherever you are, wherever you live, just like even forming community in the chat tonight, you can go and you can meet others who are navigating what you're navigating and form community and recognize that you're not alone um, and that we are all loved and valued. So please come to learn more, but also learn to um, really come to, to gain community. Um, for upcoming live streams, we encourage you to join the Peace of Mind virtual community at iocdf.org slash peace of mind. You can view the live stream, stream schedule and submit topics and questions for future events so that we can make sure we get to everything that you have. And then specifically next week, Tuesday at 7 p.m., there is a Just Ethan that isn't really Just Ethan. It actually has Tom Smalley on it, too. And they're going to be talking about anxiety together. Um, and then next Wednesday at noon, as I mentioned, there is a Chris's Corner focused on BDD, body image, and social media. So that's something I know I'm not going to miss. Um, it's something that I think is a really poignant topic right now. So um, if you have any other questions, if we skipped a question, or if you just have anything else that comes up after the stream, please email info at iocdf.org, and we will make sure that either Lauren or Ruth um, get your questions so that they're able to get back to you and continue to give beautiful insight. Um, and also, please know that if you need resources, you're welcome to visit iocdf.org. We also have a number of other great resources in the chat for you today. Um, so please like, please subscribe, and, um, and please continue to, um, to be with us for all of these resources, um, both as we learn from one another and as we form community. Thanks so much for being with us tonight.